from downtown Detroit. Local 4 News at 5 starts now. A two-year-old little boy is dead and his parents are nowhere to be found. What police are saying as they try to get to the bottom of a mystery tonight in Wayne. Not a banner day for the Blue Oval. Steering wheels may be falling off. I mean, it's terrible. So which vehicles are affected? We'll let you know. Students take to the streets. What do we want? Yes, when do we want it? Now. Protests from coast to coast demanding change and saying enough when it comes to gun violence. Often pictures are what leave an indelible mark, and this one sums it up rather succinctly. This morning, the students at Crestwood High School in Dearborn Heights came together to send their message without speaking a word. Instead, they gathered on the field, as you see there, spelling out enough. We saw scenes like that play out all across Metro Detroit and across the country as students made it clear they want action to stop gun violence. We're following today's protests from multiple angles. Jason Colthorpe is tracking protests around the country. We're going to start, though, with Sandra Ali, who's live at Cass Tech. And there, more than 2,000 students participated in the march, Sandra. Devin and Kimberly, good evening to you. You know, the demonstrations all unfolded differently, really from school to school, district to district, city to city. It's all quiet here right now at Cass Tech, but we were out here bright and early this morning when at 10 a.m., I can tell you, you could feel that wave of energy. Those doors behind me, they burst open. A flood of students, thousands of them came marching out. They were holding signs, chanting, all of them extremely energized. From Detroit to Dearborn to Berkeley and Gross Point, the student protests may have all looked different, but the message remained the same. What do we want? Not control. When do we want it? Now. So hard to think about kids dying in schools when they're supposed to be learning. We want it. We want it. Regular students who in recent weeks have become teenage activists. We are students and we don't feel safe in our schools. And people try to divide the issue by saying it's a Democrat, it's a liberal issue, it's a gun rights issue. In reality, it's just students and we need to get back to the baseline and where it all starts and that we are children who are not safe in our buildings anymore. Marking a somber anniversary with both memorials and marches, using today as a chance to make sure their voices are heard. Well, this is an issue that definitely affects all of us and that's what we wanted to extend to all the student body. Um, our purpose was actually to let them know they know it every day because they live it every day. We're victims and we will continue to be victims if nothing is done about it. So that's what we want to extend awareness and action. We talked to so many students out here today and we kept hearing the same sentiment over and over again. A number of them said to us, look, we know we're just teenagers. We know we can't vote. We're doing this today because we just want someone to hear our voice. Back to you. And whereas we're going to see here in just a second, Sandra, they had an awful lot of company uh, elsewhere because the protests here in Metro Detroit, just a small taste of what we saw across the country. Yeah, indeed. And that included Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, where 17 people were gunned down nearly one month ago. Jason Colthorpe is following that part of the story for us in the newsroom. Jason. Yeah, and Kimberly as and Devin, as you kind of alluded to earlier, just the visuals of what we saw around the country, pretty impactful, just the geography of this. Some kids standing in the warm sunshine and others braving snowstorms for this protest. And of course, it all comes on the very day the alleged gunman was arraigned in court. From coast to coast, students poured out of schools Wednesday. calling on lawmakers to take action on gun violence. Since we are the next coming voters, if you want to keep your spot in office, you need to see you need to do what we need you to do. The mass demonstrations come a month after the shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High in Parkland, Florida, and on the same day as the arraignment for confessed gunman Nicholas Cruz. Tens of thousands of students took part at as many as 3100 schools. Enough is enough. Including at Columbine High in Colorado the site of the 1999 school shooting. In Parkland, the demonstration lasted 17 minutes, one for each of those killed. I'm so proud of the kids. We need to stop this gun violence and we need to support them. In Connecticut, 17 empty chairs honored the victim's memory. In Atlanta, a solemn remembrance. 
I think this was very powerful. I think if change is, if change is wanted, then change is needed. Student activists sending a strong message to Washington. What do we want? Yes, we want. Why do we want it? Now! And to the nation. You heard enough is enough in that story at one point. In other places, Georgia and Ohio, students carried signs that read, am I next? Uh, and by the way, Kimberly, this protest today, widely regarded as one of the biggest student protests since the Vietnam War era. Back to you. It's huge. Well, Jason, uh, was there any response from the NRA that you know of? There was actually, and a uh, couple of tweets they posted uh, right around the time, right when this uh, protest began, a video asking, uh, talking about the need for more gun, uh, more people being, more security mm -hmm. at schools. And then this tweet uh, around 11.30 after it was well underway, picture of a black rifle with an American flag there with just the caption, I'll control my own guns, thank you. So. A direct response there. Indeed. Okay. Jason, we appreciate it. And our coverage of this story continues at 6 o'clock. Why one Metro Detroit school only had two students walking out. Find out why so many of their classmates were afraid to join them. Our coverage also continues online at clickondetroit.com. We've got a gallery of all the pictures of the marches. A look at the protests that happen outside the U.S., uh, which is interesting. And you can find all those stories at clickondetroit.com slash walkout. Okay, well, what a difference a day makes. I mean, the sun is shining. It yeah. finally looks like the snowflakes have kind of moved on out of town. Wouldn't mind it being a little warmer. Let's get over to Andrew. <laughs> Pretty chilly today. That's right. Very demanding audience out there. They would love <laughs> yeah. to have it be warmer as well, I can tell you. But temperatures are in the 30s. Thank goodness the snow has stopped falling, as Kimberly mentioned. We have beautiful sunshine today. Temperatures are in the 30s, anywhere from 31 degrees, some of the colder areas in the thumb and around Port Huron, 31 to 34, to middle and upper 30s at this hour. 39 for our friends in Ann Arbor, 38 degrees over at Metro Airport. Still looking at partly to mostly sunny skies here in downtown Detroit. It remains dry for the rest of your afternoon commute. And if you have any dinner plans, just bundle up because wind chills right now are mostly around 30 degrees or in the 20s. Winds are still pretty gusty out there as well. That's why you need, still need your coats, hats, scarves, and gloves required as well because wind chills well below freezing, even though temperatures are above freezing throughout most of the area. We'll talk about how much colder it gets tonight. Any more sunshine ahead for this weekend? We'll talk more about that. And the first day of spring is next week. Your seven day forecast minutes away. OK, Andrew, tonight Ford has issued a massive recall. The company says some of the steering wheels on two of its most popular sedans could come loose or even worse, detach. Business editor Rod Maloney has an up close look at the issue and which models are affected. We hear about recalls all the time. Oftentimes very technical things are wrong with the car, but this one's pretty simple. You can't drive the car safely if the steering wheel falls off. Nearly a million and a half Ford Fusions and MKZs involved in this recall. Holly Moncher of Bloomfield Hills drives an MKZ and checked her steering wheel when we told her about the problem that she didn't know about. That's very scary. I not a good thing. She says she's surprised she's even considering this kind of problem. Because everything I've ever known about Lincoln has been great and I like the service and I like the style, the drive. I would not like my steering wheel falling off. Ford reports two accidents with this steering wheel problem, one with injury. The vehicles affected are Ford Fusions, built in Flat Rock for model years 2014 to 17, built between August 2013 and February 2016. Also, Fusions built in Hermosillo, Mexico, model years 2014 to 2018, built between 2013 and this year. And finally, Lincoln MKZs built in Hermosillo, model years 2014 to 18, built between July 2013 and March of this year. Fusion driver Lauren Turner bought her car last year and is not happy with these prospects. Well, yeah, that's very troubling. Who wants to be driving in a can't do anything, it's gone. And to be clear, both Holly and Lauren love their cars. No, but you guys got me thinking about going to at least get it checked out like ASAP. <laughs> so what will they do when she gets there? Well, it turns out that the bolt inside the steering column is not long enough. They need to make it longer. And then what they'll do is they'll put that longer bolt and then they'll take a piece of nylon and put it around the threads so that when they tighten the nut, it can't come loose. So they'll start working on that very soon. Back to you. So right have they said when the recall notices will be going out, because I know sometimes it takes a while for those replacement parts to come in and get all, you know, get everybody notified. 
That's right, and that's what it's going to be. They have to get the parts in. It's going to take a while. They figure that the recall notices will officially go out at the end of April. Yeah, that's, that's huge. Okay, Ron, thanks. The Department of Public Safety has received multiple reports of a prowler in Gross Point Park. Reports that have been in the area of Balfour to Bedford Road. Police want to remind residents to lock their doors to both their homes and their vehicles. They're asking anyone to please report any suspicious activity to the Public Safety Department in Gross Point Park. The Monroe County Health Department has confirmed a case of hepatitis A in an employee who works at an Olga's Kitchen restaurant. This one is located at uh, Telegraph between Stewart and LaSalle Roads. Uh, customers who visited the restaurant between February 24th and March 14th may have been exposed to the virus. It's a critical issue that's put hundreds of Detroit students in limbo. New at 5, concerned parents left with a lot of questions after the district says conditions inside of this school are unacceptable. Also, it's not just obesity nor stress that raises your risk of having a heart attack. From diet soda to being a sports fan, Dr. Frank McGeorge sharing some of the other factors that can be trouble for your heart. Sean? Next on Local 4, we're live in Wayne with this question. What happened to this beautiful two-year-old little boy found dead inside an apartment here? Tonight, Michigan State Police are calling it a homicide. What are family members saying? Tonight, new at 6. Pleading for help with potholes. We'll show you one road in Warren you'll be glad you don't live on. Also, the bizarre incident that led police to arrest a staff member of the University of Michigan Athletic Department. What police say this man wasn't wearing when they caught up with him. Michigan State Police are investigating the death of a two-year-old in Wayne. The boy's remains were found inside a home on Wayne Road, just south of Michigan Avenue Monday. We bring in Sean Lay, who's following this story, and I guess they are treating it as a homicide, right, Sean? We just met with Michigan State Police. Devin, good evening. And yes, they say this here. They are treating this as a homicide until the facts lead them uh, in another direction. Let me show you the direction of where this crime scene is. A crime scene, according to Michigan State Police, very small apartment here on Wayne Road. This is where a beautiful two-year-old little boy named Devin was found Monday evening about this time. Little Devin Bissessi would have been two this coming May. When he was born, his mother wrote, love my little man. Now she's writing, I can't say anymore because it doesn't make any sense. After little Devin was found dead inside this apartment in Wayne, the little boy was not living with his mother or his father, but he was here with his mom's ex-husband, his girlfriend, and five other children. This past Monday at 5 o'clock, family members found the body of little Devin. Michigan State Police say they are treating his death as a homicide, although there are no outward signs of any trauma. There's nothing suspicious on top that we're actually seeing right away. Uh, but nobody expects a two-year-old to, to just die. So what happened to this little boy? That's what investigators want to know. The boy's grandmother lives in the unit below. She says she's too emotional to talk about his death. Oh, I'm sorry. I have no comment. It's right a really now. tough time. Yeah. yeah. An autopsy on the boy is underway to discover a cause of death. While investigators wait on those results, they're speaking to family members, and they'd like to find Devin's mother and his father. And it was just a natural death, uh, but we have to cover our bases. Back here live, I've just been in touch with little Devin's mom. She sent me this statement moments ago saying, quote, all I want is justice for Devin. I am 100% involved with detectives regarding Devin. Please regard my privacy at this time. So the mom says she is now in touch with police investigators. Autopsy results not in yet. We'll certainly let you know when they are. We're live in Wayne tonight. Sean Light, Local 4. It's just heartbreaking. All right, Sean. Really is. Well, the Powerball jackpot is back on the rise with tonight's jackpot at $420 million. If a Michigan player is lucky enough to win it, it would be the largest Powerball jackpot ever won in the state. If you want a chance to be the next millionaire, you need to buy your Powerball ticket by 945 tonight. The drawing will take place at 1059. <laughs>
Andrew's in for Ben. Uh, my dad has always liked to say I would complain if I was getting hung with a new rope. I, I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to complain <laughs> right. because we did have sunshine today. Exactly. We'll take it a little bit at a time. But it was brisk. It was. <laughs> yeah, that's it right. It looked yeah. a lot warmer than yeah. what it was. It yeah. was. Yeah. And the winds are still brisk as well, so that means wind chills are still below freezing out there, and we are going to see those temperatures bump up. So little by little, as you mentioned, we are going to see some improvement out there right now. Though we still have coat and jacket weather for you, and later on tonight, yes, make sure the pets are back indoors. If you've done some shopping, maybe maybe getting ready for the garden or doing some farming, make sure those seedlings, potted plants are back indoors. We're looking at temperatures tonight that will fall into the 20s, mostly middle 20s across the area. Pretty uniform, anywhere from 24 to 28 degrees in our south zone from Dundee to Carlton over to Adrian. West of 275, same sort of deal. Places like Clarkston over to Brighton, Livingston County, also around 23 to 26 degrees. North of Hall Road, same action as well. Temperatures down into the middle 20s overnight tonight. Right now, we're still being bathed in sunshine at this hour. 38 degrees currently, not bad. The temperature is above freezing, still below average. But the main thing is to watch the wind and the wind chill. Right now, we have winds blowing at 14 miles per hour, making it feel like it's below freezing. Right now, wind chill is running only around 30. So that's where wind chill is going to be through this evening if you have any dinner plans. So mostly clear, but cold later on tonight. A few more clouds tomorrow. Don't be surprised by a flurry in the afternoon, but most areas remain dry. It's still going to be on the chilly side with those clouds, but higher temperatures on the way for Friday, but especially this weekend. I'll show you the seven day forecast in just a few moments. You are going to love it. 31 degrees right now in Cape Hack and around Emmett, while it's 38 over in Dundee. Everyone sees temperatures in the 20s later tonight, and all these temperatures we're experiencing now. Sure, it's chilly, but at least these temps are four, five, seven degrees above what they were just 24 hours ago. And more good news on the way as snow con continues to move off to the east, but they're still getting pounded in parts of New York and also parts of New England. Look at these areas of light to dark blue, including in Quebec, where we're looking at uh, lots of snowfall due to that nor'easter that is still hanging around. Well, that's going to move farther away. High pressure settles in. We'll still see a healthy amount of clouds tomorrow, but as this area of high pressure gets closer, remember, much more stable air. We'll see sunnier skies for this weekend, and that translates into some higher temperatures. So look, let's look at your forecast for tonight. Temperatures down to 25 as an average temperature later tonight. Fair skies, cold conditions, sunset this evening, still getting later and later at 739. During the day tomorrow, some sun in the morning, but some clouds in the afternoon, a high of 37. Those clouds going to put a cap on those temperatures. Sunrise on your Friday, excuse me, on your Thursday is at 745, 37 tomorrow. Then on Friday, yes, March Madness coming to town. A high temperature of 39 degrees for residents and tourists and visitors who are coming over to LCA to experience the tournament. Then for this weekend, more sunshine. St. Patrick's Day on Saturday, 44 degrees. How about near 50 degrees on Sunday? Chilly or not? Spring still begins next Tuesday That's at 12:15 right. p.m. She's five still days. Got, still got the countdown clock going. Yeah. Right. <laughs> All right, thanks, Andrew. Walmart is taking another run at Amazon. New tonight, what the retailer is doing to get ahead of the curve and hopefully draw in new customers. But first, what a Michigan police chief is saying after one of his officers is caught sleeping on duty. Next. Oakland University head basketball coach Greg Campy knows more than just basketball. He's been around the game in March Madness for 34 years. He knows greatness when he sees it. Look at greatness. Even if he doesn't see it in himself. And with the good comes the bad, and that includes Twitter trolls. When you have somebody tell you that they wish you'd get anal cancer and die. That's tomorrow at 5. Across Michigan today, a Battle Creek officer facing some consequences after a photo of him sleeping in a patrol car was shared on social media. This is the photo that was shared on the internet. It's not clear when or where the picture was taken, but after seeing the photo, the police department posted a statement on Facebook. The chief states the incident was a clear violation of the department's policy, and it will be addressed with that officer. In Schoolcraft, a man remains hospitalized after repeatedly running his vehicle into a fire station. Happened just after 11 last night. This is a photo from the scene. A Jeep repeatedly ran into the bay doors of the fire station, damaging the doors, the building, two vehicles in the garage. The driver was taken to the hospital for treatment. Police, though, are still investigating the cause of the incident.
Well, pretty soon households in 100 cities across the country will be able to get groceries delivered from their doorstep or to their doorstep. I should say from Walmart. The company already offers grocery pickup, but now it's expanding to same day delivery and it's currently available already in six cities, but they plan to cover 40% of the country by the end of the year. Walmart delivery will cost $9.99 with a $30 minimum purchase. Locations will be announced as the service is rolled out in the upcoming months. New at 530. It's not just obesity or stress that raises your risk of having a heart attack. I'm Dr. Frank McGeorge. From diet pop to being a sports fan, I'll show you some other factors that might surprise you. On a day of national school walkouts, Congress passing its first measure on school safety after the Parkland shooting. But some say that it does not go far enough. I'm, I'm Mara McDonald. We're at Palmer Park Academy. Parents and children are starting to show up to figure out what's next after a water problem is closing the school for the rest of the year. Waking up to a Students in limbo. Parents are concerned and angry. The district saying conditions inside Palmer Park Prep Academy unacceptable. So what happens now? Right now, a special meeting with parents is just getting started. And the meeting comes after the school was closed for the past three days because of water damage. But what comes next really is the big question. Mark McDonald live at the school where they were closed again today. We've got some frustrated people over there. Karen, we do have some frustrated people over here for a variety of reasons. And yeah, we've got parents and students who are arriving right now. The meeting should kick off momentarily, but there are a lot of unanswered questions tonight. Yes, people are upset that there's a water problem. They're concerned about potential mold, but their biggest question is this. OK, if we're shutting this thing down, where are you sending my children and how are we going to maintain continuity? Moving trucks line the streets around Palmer Park Academy. Maintenance crews were in the back. The situation with the roof here has reached a point of no return. Teachers were threatening walkouts because of their concerns over conditions in the building. The roof has been an ongoing problem. The superintendent met with staff yesterday and he's meeting with parents tonight. At this point, it doesn't appear the students will be returning to school here for the rest of the school year. It's likely different grades will be moved to different schools. The school is pre-K through eight and offers Montessori as well. And now I got to take this child halfway across the city. You know, my position is if we're gonna do this, let's fix it. Fix it now, and I'd rather for my kid to be close to where home is. Back here live, what we have heard from parents is that they are satisfied with the education that their children receive here. They like the teachers, and if everybody is going to be moved all over the city, they want to make sure that the teacher goes with them. What's that classroom going to look like? How are they going to work out busing? Everybody has a lot of questions. Karen, Jason, back to you. And Mara, are they giving you any indication for any answers to those questions? Because that's a lot to try to solve and, and fix in such a short time period. I think they have a, well, I know they have a plan, Karen, and I think they're going to discuss it with parents today. I think we're in a situation where you're going to have, you know, various grades move to various schools, but you have parents here like Mr. Carter, uh, who you just heard from, who told me, I don't understand if it only affects part of this building, why do we have to move everybody? Um, there are many parents who don't want to see their children moved out of here because of that water problem with the roof that some people are concerned could be causing mold issues. So. I think they've got a plan. I know they've got a plan. Whether everybody's going to agree with the plan is something else entirely. Back no. to you. And ultimately, that bond between this child and the teacher ultimately is the one that gets affected, so it's tough on those kids. We will check back with you later on this evening to find out what happens. Thank you, Mara. A day of action across the country. Students walking out of their classrooms protesting gun violence. But is it sparking any action in Washington? Today, the House overwhelmingly passed a stop school violence bill. Money for training, but nothing on gun control. Blaine Alexander following all of that tonight in Washington. Well, hello to you from Washington. Both parties will acknowledge that today's bill was just a first step, but many of the students who walked out today want to make sure that the next step includes gun control. Gun control. They came to the seat of power from the White House to Capitol Hill. Thousands of students raising their voices, demanding action against gun violence. Do your jobs. Give us concrete solutions. Lawmakers are paying attention. America is listening to your voices. Today, the House overwhelmingly passing the Stop School Violence Act. 
$50 million a year to beef up school security, better training to identify warning signs, and improve coordination between schools and law enforcement. More tools to actively identify a potential shooter before a tragedy happens. But nothing on guns. President Trump has promised his support for the measure. Congressman Ted Deutsch, who represents Parkland, helped write the bill before the shooting. I know that this does not go far enough in terms of what we need to do, but it is an important step. But students say even that step is too small. But I promise you this, if they fail to make gun control laws, then in a couple years, when they're voted out, we will. The NRA tweeting its stance, I'll control my own guns. But students promising to continue their pressure for lawmakers to act on tougher gun laws. And another bill you may have heard about is the Fix Nix bill that deals with background checks when purchasing guns. That bill is still in the Senate and has not yet come up for a vote. I'm Blaine Alexander in Washington. Back to you. All right, there was an election last night too, and it's being called a political earthquake, an alarmingly close tie in a Pennsylvania district that was supposed to be a sure thing for Republicans could go to the Democrats now. So many people taking a close eye at this. The vote last night for Pennsylvania's 18th district ended up with Democratic candidate Connor Lamb taking a slight lead over Rick Saccone, a major upset against precedent for the district. Some GOP congressmen caught off guard by the possibility of losing a so-called safe seat so close to the midterms. I think that uh, if, if you're a Republican in a safe seat, you better be ready. Yeah. Um, you know, if a seat like this can go badly, that is obviously you know, pretty tough on our side of the aisle. We know that it's going to be a very uh, hard fought election cycle and we're prepared. All right. So now it all comes down to a few hundred uncounted absentee ballots. But Regardless of how the remaining votes are counted, it is likely the losing side will be demanding a recount. And quite a process there. International tensions rising as well as Russia fails to meet British demands after the attack on a former Russian spy and his daughter. Today, the prime minister announcing 23 Russian diplomats are being kicked out. Under the Vienna Convention, the United Kingdom will now expel 23 Russian diplomats who have been identified as undeclared intelligence officers. They have just one week to leave. Earlier this week, Prime Minister Theresa May gave the Russians an ultimatum, full disclosure of their involvement or the UK would retaliate. Russia has not yet responded this evening. So, Mr. Speaker, the parents of one of the victims killed in a helicopter crash in New York have filed a lawsuit against the pilot. The lawsuit accuses that pilot of failing to give the passengers a proper safety briefing and of being careless in failing to take steps to help passengers after he escaped. The lawsuit also claims the helicopter company failed to prepare passengers properly for a crash and did provide maintenance to check the pontoons that prevent the helicopter from flipping. It also says the company's policy is to provide each passenger a knife to cut through their harness in the event of an emergency. Stephen Hawken, who was considered by many as the world's greatest living scientist, died late last night. The British theoretical physicist was diagnosed with ALS back in 1963 and was only given a few years to live then. For 30 years, up until 2009, he held the position of Lucasian Professor of Mathematics at Cambridge University, which was the same position held by one Sir Isaac Newton. He has several published books probing the mysteries of the universe and is well known for his work on black holes. Stephen Hawking was 76 years old. In good health tonight, it's not obesity or stress that can raise your risk of having a heart attack. Researchers have uncovered lots of less obvious factors that can also work against you. Our Dr. Frank McGeorge joins us now with how these all interplay in terms of our heart health. Well, Karen and Jason, you know, some risk factors are actually temporary. For example, a recent study found that your risk of suffering a heart attack is up to six times higher the week after you've been diagnosed with the flu. Other risks involve things we can change and some we can't. But knowing your risk is elevated can help you be on guard. 
health. There's no question high blood pressure and obesity raise our heart disease risk, but cardiologist Prakash Balan says those aren't the only dangers we need to worry about. There are probably many risk factors that we don't yet fully appreciate. Diet soda may be one of those. Researchers suggest women who drink two diet pops a day are 30% more likely to suffer a cardiovascular problem and 50% more likely to die from heart disease. We don't really know what those chemicals are doing to our body. Another danger, hearing loss, especially the kind caused by prolonged exposure to loud noise. It might double your heart disease risk. Low vitamin D levels raise heart disease rates by 32 percent. And even being a sports fan can be hazardous. A small study showed a 110 percent jump in spectators' heart rates. People that have already a blockage um, in, in, in coronary arteries are the ones that may develop um, symptoms or even a heart attack. Natural disasters can also be a disaster for your health. In the decade after Hurricane Katrina, heart attack-related hospital admissions tripled in the affected areas. Shoulder pain is another potential red flag. Researchers found people with other heart disease risk factors were also more likely to suffer shoulder pain or rotator cuff injuries. Those with carpal tunnel syndrome and tennis elbow also had an increased risk of heart disease. Sawing logs at night? Well, snoring can be a sign of obstructive sleep apnea, a condition that raises your risk for stroke and heart attacks. Finally, if you love to binge watch your favorite shows, be sure to pause the action for a little exercise. Studies find sitting in place for long periods puts you at risk for blood clots, heart attack, or stroke. So these hidden dangers pose the most risk to people who already have underlying coronary artery disease, but of course not everyone who has heart disease knows it. So the takeaway message here is you've got to pay attention to your body, do things in moderation. If you're having any symptoms, get them checked out right away. And not fall asleep on like maybe one thing you think isn't a symptom to anything, but it could be the little step leading to another one. Well, right. You know, it's all cumulative at the yeah. end of the day. Right. So you have to like basically take care of each one of these little bitty things so yeah. that you don't end up with a larger risk. Give a second thought to my shoulder pain. I do have a quick question. How in the world does ear, because you said ear lo uh, hearing loss could mm -hmm. somehow affect? What's the connection? Probably related to underlying vascular disease. Oh, okay. Yep. All right. Mm -hmm. it's just, wow. There's lots yeah. to consider. Thanks, Doc. Got it. All right, Doc. We're just getting warmed up on a Wednesday. Hey, kids, how would you like to see a Tigers game in person this year? New tonight, the big change happening at Comerica Park for three games this upcoming season. That'll be a huge relief to some parents. But for This event has been planned here in Detroit even before this building was built. Well, now it's time. The floor is in, and Little Caesars Arena is ready for March Madness. But first, if you're a sucker for a good pit maneuver, sit back and put your feet up because we have one coming your way next that ended a very dangerous situation. Violent game. New at 6. A letter to staff here at Steve Winston High School outlines what punishment students could face if they participate in today's walkout. The reaction from students, it's as you would expect. Plus, 8 to 10 hours a night? No, teenagers are not getting the recommended amount of sleep, and the consequences may be more serious than they realize. Just Police in Washington there. State Go successfully ended a high-speed chase by spinning the car out with a pit maneuver. You can see it coming here. The pursuit began yesterday in Seattle, lasting about 30 miles before it ended in the city of Auburn. The man in the truck was a shooting suspect. Guardian During the chase, the driver hits several other cars right until they are able to finish him off with the, uh, the spin out there. No word on any Just injuries. Police determined the driver was not actually connected to the shooting, but the truck was stolen. He's been booked into King County Jail. Karen? Last minute work is underway at Little Caesars Arena ahead of a big day, a big day weekend, I should say. The arena is hosting games for the first two rounds of the NCAA tournament. Jamie Edmond shows us how LCA is ready for its first big national event. The floor here at LCA started to go in last night after the Demi Lovato concert. Now crews are putting the finishing touches, getting it ready for open practice tomorrow. This year, the road to the final floor goes through Detroit, an event U of D Mercy and Olympia Entertainment pitched to the NCAA well before LCA had even been built. You know, we just had imagination. Uh, we had some, 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 some renderings. 
Uh, of course, they had been to uh, Detroit before the Final Four, so they knew Detroit. Last night, the court was installed, built with Michigan hard maple by Connor Sports up in the UP, the official basketball court of the NCAA since 2006. So the court's made up of about 250 panels that each weigh about 188 pounds, and they come together in a process that takes, say, three to four hours. Today is about dotting all I's and crossing all T's. Come Thursday, officials expect every seat to be filled, plus a $6.5 million economic boost from the weekend. I think when we're standing inside a venue like this, what is there not to love? The energy that comes along with March Madness, the energy that's going in the city, it makes sense that we put it all together. It's a Michigan court, a building built by Michigan crews. Icing on the cake would be that Michigan State team that's playing here, walking away with two wins. From a staffing standpoint, we just want to blow everybody away this weekend. So no one's going to go up and cut the nets down here at LCA. They don't do that that early on. But that is the ultimate goal in San Antonio. And it all starts right here in the first round. At Little Caesars Arena, Jamie Edmonds, Local 4.